So um, with that, we're ready to uh, start the uh, NASA Headquarter Programs panel. Um, the, uh, the first speaker in this, um, in this panel is Dr. Ben Bussey. And uh, Dr. Bussey is uh, a former um, PI with uh, both NLSI and Survey. Um, he did some key enabling research on, uh, on lunar science, and uh, he moved to NASA headquarters a few years back to be the uh, chief scientist for human exploration. And uh, more recently, he has joined the science mission directorate where he leads, where he currently is acting leader for the Exploration Science Strategy and Integration Office. So uh, Ben, please go ahead. Ben, can you, uh, I'm not hearing you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Uh, ex okay, so for those of you on the phone, you also have to, I had to end up doing the internet version for Zoom, because. Uh, but we won't go there. Yes, yeah, so good. Um, hello, everyone. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of the Exploration Science Strategy Integration Office, where we are. Um, most of you will remember my predecessor, Steve Clark, for those that are interested. Um, he has become the Deputy AA for Aeronautics, which is a, a, a great challenge for him. And I am uh, temporarily running the office. Um, next slide, please. Great. So here's our portfolio. Um, our, our portfolio is to conduct an integrated strategy for exploration science by uh, collaboration within the divisions, the SMD divisions, uh, as well as with the other mission directorates and um, international space agencies. Many of you would have, uh, possibly have heard of something called LDEP or the Lunar Discovery Exploration Program that, that is part, uh, a significant portion, but not everything in our portfolio. So. The reason we exist is to help the development of lunar surface science instruments, to use the commercial companies to deliver those payloads to the moon, to develop mobility systems, um, to expand and enhance science investigations on the lunar surface. Um, leveraging international partners is a, a key part for what we, uh, what we try and do. Uh, we're also looking at the, uh, the, the right way to obtain new scientific data from lunar orbit, pre pre predominantly using CubeSats and SmallSats, and we're also working very closely with our HERMD colleagues on how the, the human exploration side enables science. And in fact, Jake and I will be giving a joint talk on that later. So such as Gateway and then the human landing system, uh, ultimately leading to the science planning um, for, the, for the Artemis missions. Next slide, please. So probably the highest profile thing that we do in the office is the Commercial Lunar Payload Services or CLIPS program. And this, as it says, this is utilizing commercial end-to-end -end delivery um, to enable access to the lunar surface. We currently have um, 14 companies shown in the image on the right on, on the CLIPS catalog. And we do task order, um, the way we solicit to get our payloads to the lunar surface is we issue a task order twice a year and any of those 14 companies can propose and then they are reviewed and, and when we pick one. Um, the task order typically lists what NASA wants delivered as well as any other constraints. So if, any, if, if we have very specific landing site requirements to do the science that we want to do as well as the uh, specific needs for all the instruments on our manifest. So the first four lunar surface delivery task orders have been awarded. And I think and the first two deliveries are, are you know, this time, whoever's giving this talk this time next year, it'll be a very exciting time for the office because we'll be very close to the first two deliveries by Astrobotic and Intuitive Machines. Um, within the last few months, we also selected Marston to be a CLIPS delivery in 2022, and that will go to a lunar pole. And then very recently, Astrobotic was selected to deliver NASA's Viper rover to the moon's South Pole region in 2023. Next slide, please. 
So some of you've seen this before, but this is, this is the manifest for the first two deliveries that go next year. Uh, the reason for showing this is really the color key to show that the payloads that we're taking, uh, whilst this is a, is, a, is a significant driver, we're also keen to fly other payloads, both technology demonstration payloads, as well as payloads that acquire data that are of use to, um, to human exploration. And that's represented here. And most of these payloads uh, were acquired through the NPLP solicitation. Um, next slide. And so this is then, these are the manifests for the next two small eclipse deliveries. I mentioned that Marston has already been selected to go to the South Pole. Um, it's a, we're, we're very particularly excited by um, this payload suite, predominantly made up from proposals to the LSIT P solicitation. Uh, we think this is a good, um, a good payload, a good manifest for the first US landing at a pole. We will soon be putting out a task order um, for a non-polar delivery um, with the, the seven instruments shown. And working with the PIs, um, we've decided there, uh, there's a couple of potential locations in Crisium for where uh, we want that lander to go. And then our plan going forward is, as I said at the beginning, is to have two, um, two task orders a year. Um, next slide. So how are we going to get um, payloads for the future deliveries? We have, um, as I showed, the payloads we've allocated so far predominantly came from MPLP and LCP. Um, the solicitation that we that is going to go out this summer is called PRISM for payloads and research investigation of the surface of the moon. And, and this is how SMD will acquire its payload for the manifest for task orders that occur in 2021 onwards. As I'm sure many of you are aware, we did a two-stage process. We did a stage one, essentially an RFI, and that was to help us at headquarters understand what is the interest in the science and technology community for what they want flown so that we can make sure that when we do a stage two solicitation, which is where we actually solicit for payloads, um, that we are, what we ask for, we know there's an interest in the community to provide those kinds of payloads. So when we do a stage two solicitation, we will most likely state the location for that delivery, which allows PIs to propose science optimize for that location. Uh, at the same time, we're sensitive to you know, we understand the moon scientifically, and there are lots of high value science payloads that are also location agnostic. So we are juggling that aspect as well. Um, international contributions are welcome as part, just like on a, you know, at a larger scale in the discovery proposal, you know, and up to 30% of the cost of a PRISM proposal could, cut, could be a, an international contribution. And inter, uh, as, as well, after, after PRISM call, as we build these manifests, payloads from international partners, as well as from other mission directorates, STMD and HEOMD, uh, will then be incorporated into the task order. Um, next slide. So we're, we're actively working on the lunar mobility strategy. You know, initially, we were very, we're very, you know, we are focused uh, on the value, both the science and exploration value of the poles and doing the ground truth of volatiles. We want a strategy which allows um, mobility that can last a longer and longer period of time. But we're also very aware that even non-polar um, clips deliveries, you can have an enhanced science return by having mobility. And we're looking at different options for how, how to acquire that mobility so that you can put your payloads on a mobile platform if, if that's the right thing to do scientifically and just on the static lander. Um, and my, my final slide, so, um, just even though Viper now, Viper is a, um, is a rover that started off in SEO and now it's in implementation stage, it's being run by the planetary division. Um, but I, I mentioned this because uh, this is being delivered by, as mentioned, Astrobotic in late 23. Uh, and we're obviously um, very excited by, um, by this mission. So it'll be a very capable rover. Uh, it'll follow up, obviously, the Marston polar delivery to get us even more information on where the volatiles are. And with that, I will stop and um, go to the next talk. 
Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ben. And I forgot to mention at the beginning that the format of this is going to be that uh, each presenter will will talk and then we will take questions in a panel um, group format uh, at the end. So uh, Ariel, go ahead. Great, thanks. So our next speaker is Jake Bleacher. He's the Chief Exploration Scientist at the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. So Jake's going to be giving us an update on HEOMD. Jake, we can't hear you. All right. Can I get a sound check now? Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks for the introduction. Um, as uh, Ariel mentioned, uh, I am uh, at NASA headquarters working for uh, Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate as the Chief Exploration Scientist, uh, which was a position that Ben held before me. Um, and that um, has been a great opportunity for us to uh, work closely together between SMD and HEOMD, uh, along with a number of other colleagues. Um, and so what we have here today um, at this point is a few slides uh, that are gonna be presented jointly by Ben, Sarah, and myself uh, to go over uh, what we've developed over the last several months, uh, an Artemis science plan, and uh, also some updates uh, additional to what Ben has already given. Um, and I think the first few slides here are going to be presented by Ben, and then he'll hand off to me, and then Sarah will close us out. So, uh, Ben, if you're still online, uh, go ahead. Apologies, I didn't realize I was going if I'm sure if people realize that you're going to get back-to-back -back Ben talks, you would have um, slept in. Um, so anyway, so yes, as, as Jake talked about, we have... Um, we have been starting to think about what is the science we want to try and achieve from once we get humans back on the lunar surface. And as you know, don't really have to tell this audience, but it, um, you know, the moon enables scientific exploration really is a cornerstone for solar system science and ex exoplanet studies, uh, a natural laboratory to study planetary processes and evolution. It's also an important training ground to learn how to conduct scientific um, exploration from a planetary surface, working together with crew and robotic explorers. And also it's an opportunity to use the infrastructure and resources associated with having crews on the surface to leverage that to do scientific investigation. Next, next slide. Thank you. So, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel here. A lot of people have thought about this for a long time. And we started off, we went to, there are a plethora of documents, both US and international documents that have considered this. And as you read through all of these, we found that you could really summarize the science that you want to achieve under these six themes. Um, you know, study of planetary processes, understanding volatile cycles, the impact history of the Earth Moon system, record of the ancient sun, um, fundamental lunar science, and a platform to study the universe. And so we, we've, we've been looking at this with a view um, to understand what do the crew need to be able to do in order, and what type of science do we actually want to conduct so that we can ask our HEO colleagues for what we need to get that science on. Next slide. And so this does feed into sort of the four exploration objectives that Jake will talk about um, in, in, more de in more detail. You know, field geology with mobility, collection return and new sample, you know, access to the cold regions, and the ability to have delivered and install instrumentation on the surface. Next slide. So I'll just go through these six very quickly. You know, the idea here, the, when we say study of planetary processes, um, the moon really is a mini planet uh, and, and has under, uh, undergone large scale, you know, differentiation, impacts, vol volcanism by studying the moon we can get a better understanding on how the terrestrial planets formed, um, formed and evolved. Next slide. So, you know, it's now generally accepted that the moon has several, you know, there are several different types and sources for the for, for volatiles on the lunar surface. 
uh, both st- um, volatiles that might have been delivered as well as volatiles essentially made on the moon, as well as volatiles that date back to the origin of the moon. And we really want to understand um, all three of those water cycles um, to, to get a better understanding of, the, uh, of both the science and exploration part of this. Next slide. Obviously, the moon, uh, moon and Earth sit at roughly you know, the, same, the same distance from the sun, and we want to understand the impact history of the Earth-Moon system. Can't do that on the Earth with the craters being erased, whereas the moon really does retain what is the impact record of the Earth-Moon uh, history. And, and this is important because we know that impacts have had a major effect on Earth throughout geologic time, you know, you know, in, including what, particularly once life was on Earth and this is something that you can only study on the moon and you can't study on it. Next slide. So the, the lunar surface has been bathed in solar wind for the last you know, four and a half billion years. Um, and the dust grains retain this information. And so buried regolith as well as regolith trapped between lava flows could contain historical record of the fluxes of the early sun. And so by having a crew on the surface, detailed, very careful detailed excavation and study uh, can retrieve this record. Next slide. Sorry, screen saver just kicked in. So I can't see the slides. There we go. Um, platform to study the universe. Um, so the lack of an atmosphere allows the full electromagnetic spectrum to be visible from the lunar surface. Uh, and indeed, the far side of the moon is it's unique in the solar system, we believe, to be permanently shielded from Earth radio noise, allowing much more sensitive measurements to be made that look back further in time. And also, potentially, uh, astronomical observations might be an example of uh, opportunistic science that you could do to leverage the infrastructure there because of crew. Uh, next slide. And the last one is fun, what we saw here. This one's always a bit hard to pick a title for, but calling it fundamental lunar science. And this is essentially science that you can do because you're on a fractional gravity body with deep space radiation. And so there's a lot of life sciences, science combined effects of, uh, of, of those two things, as well as exploration physics, such as combustion science, fluid dynamics, dust and material science. Uh, there's, there's fundamental physics. You can do general relativity, gravitational physics, quantum information science. Um, as well as food drug degradation. As we go further into the solar system with people, we want to understand how the nu- nutritional value and the drug usefulness works uh, when exposed into deep space for long periods of time. But, and these are, these are all examples of things that sort of we categorize as fundamental lunar science. Next slide. And now I'll hand over um, to, to, to Jake, who will cover uh, the next portion. Great, thanks, Ben. Um, and so, um, working together with SMD, uh, as Ben mentioned, we, you know, we weren't trying to reinvent any wheels. We we're trying to pull from the wealth of uh, documentation that many of you online have participated in providing over the last decade plus. Um, and so, as um, SMD pulled that material together, uh, we also looked back across uh, HUMD, as there's also research that uh, that we're interested in conducting. Um, and I think we can characterize human research for risk reduction in the uh, mind frame of trying to establish sustainable human exploration in the solar system. And so with respect to this, uh, we have activities already ongoing here at the Earth, uh, simulated habitats and operations on the surface, as well as taking advantage of the platforms we have in low Earth orbit. Uh, so this is really kind of the starting point for where we can start to characterize the risk that we're going to be facing as we explore the solar system, the moon, and, and later on to other destinations. At the moon, uh, we now have um, a location away from the Earth where we can start to characterize some of these risks. And this will be an integrated approach using orbital assets at the moon as well as our surface assets uh, as we begin exploring the lunar surface. Uh, this will really be an important step to uh, characterize and understand how to mitigate that risk for human crews that will be exploring the moon for longer durations, being in orbit uh, and low gravity, 
Uh, and this is an opportunity to characterize uh, those risks so that we can plan for moving on um, into other destinations. So I think one way to characterize all this is down in the lower right hand corner of this slide. Um, we want to characterize the risks. Uh, we kind of have five groups that we put that into. Understanding isolation and confinement, um, being distant from the earth for our human crews, uh, experiencing changes in gravity, uh, experiencing the radiation environment, and working in hostile closed environments. So the surface assets that we'll have at the moon, including the gateway and orbit, give us an opportunity to begin to characterize uh, these risks and develop a mitigation plan. Uh, the goal is to be able to continue sustained exploration of the moon as we also think about other targets. And so this is a critical step moving forward for us. Next slide, please. So by merging the SMD goals and the HEOMD research goals, uh, we put together the strategy for Artemis Science. Um, and I apologize, I have some folks working uh, in my house suddenly today. So uh, if you hear that or dogs barking, um, Greg did mention that uh, we're not quite sure how all these things work out in this uh, socially distant virtual world we're in now. Uh, so I apologize, my dogs do mean well, they're just trying to keep me safe, uh, but they are very loud, so apologize for that. Um, so by thinking about the, the breadth of the SMD research goals, the HEOMD um, research goals to characterize and, uh, and mitigate risk to, to our human crews, um, we can start to think about advancing beyond the Apollo paradigm. Uh, and so Ben had a slide earlier that characterized kind of these four exploration goals. So again, understanding the full breadth and integration of the research that we want to conduct at the moon is the basis for ensuring that we develop requirements on the HEO systems that enable us to meet those goals. So um, working through everything that Ben presented, um, you know, one of the most important things we want to think about um, on the surface is how do we conduct science kind of in the field on the surface of the moon. Um, it's really important that we provide mobility as well as time to access different units, different materials, different locations so that we can do the jobs that meet the goals that were presented by Ben earlier. Making sure that we can collect new samples that uh, are not currently represented in the Apollo sample suite. Uh, this is another critical um, aspect to uh, exploring the moon. Making sure that we can put into place the types of surface in instrumentation, making sure that one, uh, on the SMD side, we're um, identifying the right instruments and getting them built, and then working together, making sure we can put them in place so that they can make those right, uh, make those measurements. Um, we are well aware from uh, our interactions with SMD that uh, we're going to need to access cold regions and access colder temperatures uh, than maybe were experienced during Apollo. Uh, so that includes just understanding that environment, um, collecting the critical data to help us understand what that environment is, and then being able to apply the correct requirements on the systems that we develop uh, as we explore the moon. Next slide, please. And so this next slide talks about this bold new era of human discovery. Uh, and so we try to um, link up those uh, objectives there with some of the um, capabilities that may need to come out on the human exploration side. Uh, so the opportunity to study broadly planetary processes as applicable to understanding the solar system. Again, recognizing that this is going to require mobility and time to access diverse terrains and unique locations that we haven't yet explored. Understanding the volatile cycles at the moon, uh, we know again, requires us to be able to access um, persistently shadowed and cold terrains that may be either robotically or with crew. That first step to that is understanding what the environment is that we have to deal with. Um, and it may be that we can um, access that by developing um, additional containers or sample curation um, techniques that enable us to get in there and get out rapidly, um, again, either with crew or, or robotics. So it's critical that we understand not just what the environment is, but what do we need to do with the samples once we've collected them? And how do we need to curate them to make sure that we can do the science we want to do back here on Earth? 
Um, understanding that history of the Earth Moon system, this is a good example of how that levies requirements on the types of tools that we're building. Um, as we know from our Ap Apollo experience, we want to collect small um, walnut sized rocks, potentially with rake devices uh, that can then be dated to give us chronological analyses um, to understand that impact history on the, on the Earth Moon system. Uh, again, how do we build our tools? Uh, understanding that record of the ancient sun that Ben mentioned, we need to design our tools to make sure that we um, can collect those regolith layers and don't disturb them such that we lose the data that we're there to, to, to identify and collect. Um, a stable platform for studying the universe. Uh, we need, again, to be able to deploy the types of instruments that we want to have. We need to access the locations that we need to be at to, to make those measurements. We can look at the radio silent areas of the moon as another resource. If this is one uh, limited location that we have access to that radio silence, not only do we need to be able to access it properly and deploy the types of instruments, but we also need to be able to preserve it. It's very similar to understanding the volatile cycles and the, the um, volatiles and ices that we're accessing. Um, we want to look at those both as a science target as well as a potential resource and how, do, how does that juxtaposition of those two objectives meet. Uh, experimental science enabled by the lunar environment, uh, extending our uh, human operations in that fractional gravity environment, uh, making sure that we have the down mass to include those experiments along with the, the instruments that we want to take. So this is where why we really needed to pull all that information together, because this really drives out the capabilities and the, ultimately the requirements that we need to place on the systems we're developing on the human side to make sure we can meet the goals that are being provided to us uh, from the Human Research Program, as well as the Science Mission Directorate. Next slide, please. And so with that in mind, um, oop, we had a slide there that just put all of the rest of those um, uh, points uh, in place. Uh, but anyway, those are the objectives. We just walked through them with you. Um, and that is uh, is the point where I'm going to hand off to Sarah now. Yeah, it looks like maybe I lost that slide. That's uh, apologies on my side. Um, so I'll hand off to Sarah now and she will uh, she will carry us through the rest of this presentation. Thanks, Sarah. And I, uh, uh, Sarah, I'd like to do a very quick uh, introduction since you didn't get uh, introduced. Um, and so, uh, and so Sarah Noble, Dr. Sarah Noble is the lead sci lunar scientist for uh, SMD. Um, she has uh, had an accomplished um, research career in uh, lunar science uh, with her uh, PhD from, uh, from Brown and after that. Um, she is our program scientist at, uh, at Survey, amongst many other uh, duties within SMD. And uh, for those who might not be aware, um, she's also quite a, an accomplished artist and puts out a, a, a painting um, at every uh, full moon, which uh, I always enjoy seeing. So uh, Sarah, um, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Good, excellent. Uh, let's see, so thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Jake and Ben, for covering a lot of that. And I hope you all got the idea that it is, in fact, really a great time to be a lunar scientist right now. Um, even before we get to Artemis, like think about all of the things we have going on uh, in, for our community at the moon right now, right? From orbit with LRO and, and, Art and Themis Artemis up there still going strong with our, with our CubeSats coming up, Trailblazer, not to mention uh, the others. You know, I think that the moon is a great place for us to like work on small sets and, and cube sets and we are just starting to test those things out. We're getting back to the surface. It's been a long time since we've been to the surface, but we have things on the books now to get us back to the surface. Ben talked about clips about the, the three landers that we already have on contract. Uh, and, and there's more to come. And you can see that, you know, as we evolve this program, as, as we learn about CLIPS and CLIPS learns about us, that the, this is an evolving program that is getting better and stronger. Uh, and we are driving towards, you know, bigger science. Uh, you know, we talked about the difference mm -hmm. between, you know, the N N L NPLP and the LSITP calls as to compared to what we're gonna be doing with PRISM, which is a lot more science driven. It's the actual suites of instruments going to specific places to do big science. Uh, and so I'm very excited about the direction that's going. It's only going to get better. Uh, and again, it's two opportunities a year to land things on the surface of the moon. I think 
we really have to understand what that means in terms of the science that we can do. Uh, Viper, we're, we're going to hear a lot more about Viper this afternoon. I won't steal their thunder, but uh, that is fantastic. We're again getting back down to the surface and doing doing real science. Uh, it's a great example of a of a of like LRO was, where we we are science and, and exploration uh, needs. Uh, combine and we are, are being able to serve both communities at the same time. So that's a fantastic thing. Uh, and don't forget about ANCSA. You know, in, in the lab, we, we have, we're opening new samples for the first time in, in decades. Uh, and, and that's really exciting too. I know they've been slowed down a little bit by COVID, but haven't we all? Uh, but, but that is coming too. And, and, and in some ways, that's like a whole new Apollo mission for us. Uh, and it's teaching us also about the, the ways to do this as we move forward and, and how do we uh, curate those samples and how do we do preliminary exam and things like that. And so I think uh, we are really building uh, using ANCSA uh, towards what we're going to do with Artemis. Uh, next slide. And I know you guys all want to be part of all of this excitement. And so just a couple of reminders about things that we have in the near term coming up. Uh, we will be putting out a call for, for Viper Co-Eyes. Um, rather than waiting till, you know, just before launch and doing a sort of traditional PSP, we're planning to put that call out soon. I won't give you a date on that because it mostly depends on when I can get it written, but, but soon-ish, uh, we will be putting out a call to, to add additional Viper Co-Eyes to that team uh, to get people uh, thinking about that science and, and what we can do with the data that's coming back from Viper. PRISM, I know you are all very anxiously awaiting the PRISM call. Uh, we are working on that. Um, hopefully we will have some more information coming out soon, like within days soon, not, not months. Uh, so we can hopefully scratch that itch. Um, and I, I knew I was gonna get this question later, so I thought I would address it here. Uh, Survey CAN4, we are thinking about it. We are starting to, to think, think and plan towards it, but there is no timeline yet for it and there won't be for a while. So you can keep asking, but I don't have any more information for you uh, on that. Um, and then the one thing that I didn't put on here and I should have is because again, we do want participation from the community um, and we are doing uh, again, later this month, another installment of the Lunar Surface Science Workshop uh, sessions that were, you know, the, the meeting that was canceled in April. We had a kickoff meeting uh, in June uh, and did our first session on tools and instruments. Uh, the end of this month, we are planning to do sessions on volatiles and sample science. Um, there will be uh, a save the date coming out hopefully today, I think, on that so you guys can get more information. Uh, and, and our intention is to continue doing these sort of once a month or every other month uh, as we get them together uh, as individual sessions to allow everybody opportunities to, uh, to um, participate as much as you can and, and, and give us the information that we need to maximize the science that, that our miss is going to be able to do. Um, and I think that's my last slide. I think the next slide is actually Jake's. <laughs> Well, there we go. Thank you, Sarah. There, there are, uh, again, we just want to close out with the Artemis science objectives. So um, as we talked about, we, you've heard from Ben and, and Sarah and myself, a number of uh, exciting things going on that are trying to address these objectives, collecting data to help us understand how to, uh, how to meet some of these goals and how to prepare and build our uh, human exploration system so that we're enabled to meet those goals. Um, but we just wanted to bring those uh, together here for you. Uh, we presented these also at the Lunar Surface Science Workshop uh, kickoff meeting a month or so ago. So um, again, these are, as Ben said, the, I don't think this is anything that's shocking to anybody on the line today. Uh, we pulled most of this information uh, together by looking at the documents that you all contributed to. Uh, so, but we're trying to pull it all together so that between HEOMD and SMD, we have an integrated uh, clear understanding of where we're heading and what the community wants to see done. And as we move forward, you know, each one of these bullets will uh, become ever increasingly more detailed uh, as we work down to what does that actually mean to do that job on the lunar surface. And as Sarah mentioned, uh, we'll continue to work on uh, these virtual workshops to, uh, to kind of hash that out for us and help us figure that out. Um, so I think with that, our, uh, our initial talks from the three of us are done now. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks to uh, all three of you. Um, one thing that uh, I had 
I was going to note at the beginning um, and uh, and neglected to note is is that uh, one thing that I'm seeing at uh, at headquarters. I spent a few years there myself. Is is a degree of um, cross directorate um, collaboration. Um, that I have not seen in, in my 35 year career with, uh, with NASA. And it's um, congratulations to the people that you just heard speak um, for all of that. Going, going forward to the moon is a job for, uh, for all of us. So uh, I'm so glad to see that. And thanks, um, thanks to all of you for a great presentation. So I'll let uh, Ariel take over. So next speaking to us is Dr. Rachel Quima, and Rachel's a research scientist at the Applied Physics Lab and is the lead for the Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium, LSIC. Um, so that's based at APL, and Rachel's going to give us an update on what they've been up to. Okay. Um, do I need video on or no? If you want, we're encouraging it. Okay. It seems like the host is not allowing it, <laughs> which is not usually a bad idea, but I did put on my M cube shirt just for this and my moon <laughs> necklace. So <laughs> you should be able to turn on your camera now. Oh, that's weird. Uh, no, it's still not going. That's fine. doesn't matter. Um, all right. I will try to share my screen first here. Um, are you seeing the presentation in the proper mode? Yes, we are. Okay, excellent. So um, I'm gonna talk briefly about the Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium, which is a group that it's, it's a new initiative coming out of the Lunar Surface Innovation Initiative, which is an initiative through the Science Technology uh, Mission Directorate. And um, so this is, its genesis is from the technology side but um, it kind of underlies a lot of um, what's going on throughout NASA and is the hope is that this will provide a very direct, um, let me just move to this because I've got the words on the screen, um, a direct communication pathway between the community, the lunar community being um, industry, academia, other government institutions and nonprofits with NASA so that they can flow um, some of the technology developments that are being made in the various focus areas of the LSII directly to the community and then receive feedback from the community about um, what's missing, um, you know, how, how these technologies can be used for what one of the things that Clive asked in the in the chat for building towards a sustainable presence that doesn't just center on what NASA is doing but actually pulls in the different stakeholders over time. So, you know, our, how can we leverage all the work that NASA is doing as a s entire planetary society? Sorry, that's, <laughs> I didn't mean planetary society, like the planetary society, but as the entire um, world moves towards trying to establish this sustained presence on the moon. So how do we understand what's going on and build that into our, um, programs that go beyond just NASA. So um, the goals of the LSIC are to, to try to harness the creativity beyond NASA and get this dialogue going. Um, I apologize, these edited slides don't have nonprofit in the list for number one, but we are um, ex um, explicitly working to see how some of the opportunities that maybe weren't open to nonprofits can become open to nonprofits in the future. Um, to look at the surface technology developments that are key to um, getting some sponsor support from NASA, especially STMD, in order to build this kind of future um, on the moon and onto Mars. And then to also, all the, I know we have, uh, we've got SERVI, we've got LPI, um, we have um, League, we have kind of centralized space and exploration related websites but we're going to try to uh, provide a portal that links to all of those resources and also pulls in some of this technical information and um, you know, the, the technology relevant data that um, the community can then access in a central location. So um, we, we have an actual like ELSIC group that has been forming and I'll, I'll have a page 
um, later in this in this talk where you can access the website and sign up if you're not already a member. But as a whole, um, some of the things we're trying to achieve are identifying some of these key technology needs that might um, might be a little bit beyond what's already being worked on by NASA, what maybe um, build on those. We would like to kind of serve the entire um, lunar community without bias and make this as publicly available as possible. We'll be hosting um, meetings. We have two semi-annual meetings in the year. And then we've got these ongoing focus group meetings that are gonna be monthly to discuss the key areas. So I won't dwell on this too long since I, I know you're gonna to wanna to have time for um, questions. And you know, I have on here build community. We recognize that there is an extremely vibrant um, science and exploration community for the moon already. But we want to reach out to folks um, that maybe are not as heavily involved um, and have different viewpoints. So looking out to um, academic institutions that have not historically been as involved with lunar exploration um, and to bring in fresh ideas, also to reach out to other um, government agencies, other, other groups that um, terrestrial companies that could branch into lunar work, but maybe don't see the value proposition in that yet, and to really engage with all of these stakeholders to try to make this sustainable in the long run. So um, we have focus groups that center on the capability areas that are called out by the Lunar Surface Innovation Initiative. That's ISRU, dust mitigation, surf, uh, extreme access, surface power, extreme environments, and excavation construction. And these are the groups where we'll have the ongoing monthly uh, telecons and um, where a lot of the technical, will we'll kind of group things into these technical areas. But we're also gonna have a lot of dialogue between them because clearly um, there are important cross-cutting topics that go between, for instance, ISRU and excavation and construction. So um, this is not meant to stovepipe the, um, the technologies, but rather to kind of give a forum that focuses on those. And then we, we have a lot of crossover in our membership between the different groups. And um, we'll make sure that the facilitators are all kind of communicating. So um, I was, I had authorized <laughs> by STMD, I wanted to show you, um, since I'm not from NASA and I can't give out money, um, I wanted to at least provide an idea of what kind of investments STMD is making into this, um, because that is another key role of ELSIC is to help the inform the community about some of the investments that uh, and opportunities for proposals um, that are out there uh, as far as tech development. And you know, one of the big ones that we unveiled at the meeting in February was this luster uh, opportunity, which is still coming uh, later this summer. And just a couple of days ago, they introduced the um, power challenge, which is the Watts on the Moon challenge, which is talking about storage of power. So it's not power generation, but it's like um, there's several facets to um, storing power, providing power. And I encourage you to take a look. The RFI is open now for comments. And I have the link on the final page, but it's a very gnarly link with a lot of um, funny characters. So we will also link that from the ELSIC webpage so that you can just click to get there. So um, before I run any further over, the website for ELSIC is elsic.jhuapl.edu. If you're not involved in our email lists and want to join, we've got um, meetings coming, uh, coming up this month and then a meeting probably in the very first week of September. And then here is the Watts on the Moon um, link, <laughs> which I guess you can screenshot it. It's not as bad as uh, having to, to do this. Um, and an actual meeting. So I will leave it there and then hopefully we still have time for questions. Great, all right. Well, uh, thanks so much, Rachel. We're super excited about uh, ELSIC as it, as it moves uh, forward. A lot of progress um, since the kickoff meeting in um, just this last uh, February. So we have uh, one more talk um, in this session and hopefully just a few minutes for uh, questions before Mr. Bridenstein gets on. And uh, that talk's gonna be given by uh, Andy Petro, who is now in HEOMD and, and was formerly in, uh, in space technology. 
Um, he is the lead for uh, space comm and, uh, and navigation for the arch architecture of that and development of that for the uh, moon. So uh, Andy, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me just check that you can hear me. Yes, we can and, and feel free to turn your camera on as well. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I think there's a couple of parts if they can bring up to. Um, so I'm going to talk about the communications and that service at the moon. And uh, I mean, as everyone knows, there's also just, uh, communications and tracking uh, network that already exists to support lunar activities. It, it has, um, as it has in the past, uh, that is being uh, enhanced and upgraded to support this new era in lunar exploration. But above and beyond that, uh, we're beginning to implement uh, an integrated architecture uh, that will, will go beyond that, including things like relays, crosslinks, and, and kinds of navigation services for our lunar activities. And those are to support the science exploration and the technology development missions. Uh, we're working on a regular basis uh, across all the organizations, all of the elements and activities. Uh, as Greg had mentioned, there's a great uh, interaction among the different uh, mission directors and organizations at NASA. I talked to people like Ben, Sarah, people on this panel, and, and many others on, on a regular basis on, on this subject. So we're working together on that. Uh, the idea is uh, what we're calling a LunaNet concept that would include not just the, the typical data transmission services, uplink, downlink types of things, but position navigation and timing service and information services, uh, things that might provide um, space weather alerts to various missions, um, collision avoidance kind of information, uh, predictions of impacts on the surface, the, the types of things that could be shared and would be uh, valuable across all of the uh, various missions operating uh, in, on the, and around the moon. Uh, one of the early driving requirements for um, the system will be um, early far side mission and also the moons in the polar regions. Uh, operating near the poles uh, means that the, the Earth is very low on the horizon uh, for direct communication. So uh, it's very likely there will be interruptions in that and uh, some interesting places that people will want to explore uh, may also be somewhat difficult to reach in a, in a direct Earth communication. So we think that working relays uh, that can provide coverage overhead would be uh, extremely valuable for that for the science missions um, and well as uh, the human missions to come. Uh, our goal is interoperability across uh, what we expect to be multiple providers of these services and all of the multiple users. And we expect those service providers to include commercial vendors and international partners. And in fact, a lot of this is not, will not necessarily be uh, government uh, built and government operated, but but uh, working with a a collection of, of providers. So interoperability is very important, and we see that's a key role for NASA to help um, in that coordination. And uh, with the the overall goal that individual missions shouldn't need for their own uh, communications and navigation infrastructure, that's something that 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 should be there so that people can. Uh, build their missions around those capabilities rather than having to include the cost of that in, in their own projects. And overall, we want to begin small and uh, keep it affordable. Uh, you know, there's many things that are beyond our control in, in big programs like this, but one thing we can do uh, in order to, um, to, to, you know, to have control over what, what happens is, is to keep things small and keep them affordable. Um, and that's, that's the approach we want to take. We, uh, in, you know, intend to do this in, um, you know, through a series of, of um, generational um, increments. So um, I don't see the, the charts. The second chart I had um, was going to um, talk a little bit about the uh, relays and just 
the the importance of having relays. Obviously, you know, relay satellites or the moon. Obviously, it's essential for any far side landers or over instrument packages that, that don't have uh, a direct Earth view. But it's also very valuable for any kind of polar operations uh, wherever the uh, direct Earth view is, is blocked. And um, another important thing is that having a, a relay nearby reduces the, the link length, you know, between that, that user and their on service, so they don't have to have some size to uh, go all the way back to uh, back to Earth. So that means they can have smaller um, and lower power systems, uh, for example, on rover or, or other package. Uh, and that should be very easy for a lot of missions. You flip to the next chart, if, if you'd like, uh, it's what I'm discussing right now about the relays. Um, also, you know, if we want to have globally distributed instrument networks, again, this is, uh, relays could be very valuable. Each of those, um, stations that, that have a smaller constant and, and still and send their data back to Earth. And we can provide local links between multiple users and, and avoid having to go from, from there back to Earth and, and then back to the moon again, which you know reduces the, the time delays and it reduces the demand on, on the Earth's receivers, which, which are going to be uh, you know, heavily taxed with all of this uh, information coming back, back from the moon. And you know, again, we can aggregate data uh, provide cross-link capability and better manage the demand on those uh, stations. And we also expect that the relays can host navigation pins uh, and disseminate the information I was talking about, the position, navigation, timing, and situational awareness. And, and overall, it, it, it can provide a more robust and flexible operations for all of the, um, the missions on the moon. And uh, you know, just overall provide a more uh, flexible and capable uh, service for everyone. And we know there's broad interest in developing and implementing uh, lunar com relay services among the country and uh, among international partners and certainly within NASA. And as I, I said before, we anticipate that uh, much of this will be provided through commercial vendors uh, around the world. And uh, we see NASA playing mainly a coordination role in, in, you know, helping it all come together into a, a very uh, smoothly operating interoperable system. So that's all I had to share with you this morning and appreciate the opportunity to, to bring up what I think is a very important subject for anybody that wants to be operating out the moon. So thank you. Great, great. Well, uh, thank you so much, um, Andy. And, and um, what I hope the message is that uh, everyone is, has received, um, you know, and, and I, I think that this last talk really brings it together is that uh, we're going back and we're going back to stay. You're gonna be hearing more about that in the next um, three days. But uh, I'm encouraged um, personally to a level that, uh, that I haven't been in my uh, in my career, um, I think that NASA um, and all of its partners are doing doing the right things here. And uh, boy, it just couldn't be more exciting. So um, we would like to. I know that the uh, administrator is uh, is ready to come on, um, but I would like to take the opportunity to uh, to um, take a few uh, questions. And um, let's let's see, um, Ariel would, uh, Ariel actually has to leave um, at, uh, at nine o'clock Pacific. So um, would you like to do the uh, first one, Ariel? Sure. Um, I actually had a quick question for Ben. I know you mentioned a couple of the exciting missions coming up and I was wondering if you could quickly talk about some of the synergies between the, the Mastin Polar Rover and the Viper Rover or differences and how that kind of feed forward into Artemis as a whole. Yes, um, certainly. So if you look at the, um, at the manifest for the Mastin delivery, you'll see a lot of overlap with the Viper Rover where you are flying some duplicates um, and if not exact duplicate, then at least acquiring a similar data set. So the idea is that you know, the, the Marston, Ro Marston lander will go to a stationary point. Uh, it, will, it still has sampler that can access below the surface. 
So we should still get, we should get our first key data. You know, we've, we've been a lot of pent up demand for proving whose model is right and wrong. And so Marston will start that process. And then I think that will help feed into potentially the Viper ConOps from what we learned from Marston because it is acquiring, it, its payload suite is very similar to the Viper Rover suite. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. I can read one um, from the uh, from the chat. This is from Barbara Cohen. Um, can Sarah describe what the scope of the Viper COI call will be? Will it be to propose one's own science investigation, friends similar to traditional PS proposals? What will the criteria be? Yeah, well, we're still writing it, so details still TBD. But yes, the, the idea is that it will be uh, similar to a, to a traditional PSP program where, where you would propose your own science, but you will also be integrated into the team uh, and participating in, in team meetings and discussions. Thank you. Um, we also have a question for Rachel. This is questions from Angela de Promont which is the technology focus and the origin of the consortium was mentioned. But we're curious if there's any interest in incorporating space policy related goals that could serve to inform the technology decisions and the goals. Um, I was just typing a response in case we didn't get to this one. So um, yes, um, I think we have to, so we have to maintain sort of the technology focus side for the focus areas, but I'm very interested in pulling in um, the work that some are starting to do like with um, Open Lunar as far as discussing some of the policy um, and kind of like how, if we're gonna have a sustained presence on the moon, what what are the societal impacts and the kind of um, policy and even like, I don't wanna say morality, but I am saying it <laughs> apparently, but like kind of the, the bigger, more human implications of that. Um, so I, I'm kind of in the middle of working out um, how to include that somehow. Um, so I guess the answer is yes, um, but it's like, it won't be, if you're interested, email me <laughs> because I'm trying to kind of have these discussions um, about how's the best way to fold this into our discussions, especially when we have the entire group meet. Um, the, the highly focused um, monthly meetings are gonna be mostly surrounding the technologies and whatnot. But when we're talking about the larger effort, I think this is something we wanna give, um, give a voice to in our um, LSIC wide events. Great, great, all right. Thank you, uh, um, Rachel. So um, here, this is a question from Clive Neal. Question for, for the NASA panel, how is NASA HEOMD and SMD planning for sustained and sustainable human presence on the moon as indicated recently in the Artemis rollout? Science alone won't be enough, I fear. Anyone wanna take that? Uh, I can take a quick stab at that. I think that dovetails very nicely with the, the prior question that, um, that Rachel was um, answering. Um, you know, we do have to consider the breadth of objectives for the lunar surface and exploration of the moon. And, um, you know, an example that, that I kind of point to often is looking at volatiles and ices on the surface. They can be considered as a resource target. They can also be considered as a science target. And so we have to start learning how do we have um, these different goals uh, meet with each other. And, um, you know, we have talked from the very beginning, uh, the Space Council has mentioned the reason we're going to the South Pole is to, because we can take advantage of the resources there. That includes not only the water, but also the light. So we have to think about from a planning perspective, you know, things like if you put up a big solar array, um, it's, it's not like something that like ice where you're digging down to get to the resource. A solar array basically blocks the light for, you um, the terrain behind it um, from the perspective of the sun. So there's a lot that we have to balance there. And I think that trying to meet the objectives that are presented to us um, uh, will require this kind of collaboration as Rachel was talking about. Um, so that's why we're trying to get these integrated strategies pulled together that include SMD goals, that include STMD goals, that include HEOMD goals. 
uh, because the decisions that are being made with respect to how we build these things are going to impact everybody that has an objective at the lunar surface. Um, so very much agree, Clive, I, and I hear your point, science alone probably doesn't cut it here, but there are significant uh, technology goals. Um, so from a utiliz utilization perspective, you know, that's what we're trying to get a handle on is what are the breadth of those objectives so that we can make sure we're designing an architecture that enables us to, uh, to address all of them. Great, great. Well, thank you so much, Jake. And it is nine o'clock uh, right now. So uh, I want to thank, thank our distinguished panelists, um, Ben Bussey, Jake Bleacher, Sarah Noble, Rachel Klima, and Andy Petro for their, um, their perspectives. I hope this has gotten you, um, all of you, as excited as uh, I am about uh, our return to the moon. Um, what a great time this is. Um, as Sarah put it so well, it's a great time to be a, a lunar scientist. I couldn't agree more. So thanks to all of you. Thanks also to my um, co-chair, Dr. Ariel Deutsch. Um, and. Uh,